Summary of Bartleby, The Scrivener by Herman Melville. The story takes place in a Wall Street law office in the middle of the 1800s. It starts with the unnamed narrator, the lawyer, saying that he wants to tell a story about a group of people who haven't been written about yet, Scriveners, or Lacopiists, whom he knows a lot of. But instead of telling the story of a group of them, he will tell the story of Bartleby, who is the strangest person he has ever met. After explaining that his office is occupied by himself, two other Scribner employees, Turkey, who is a drunk and is only useful before lunch, and Nippers, who has some kind of habit that makes him only useful in the afternoon, and a 12-year-old office boy named Ginger Nut, the lawyer says that he has put up an ad to hire a new employee. The lawyer hires Bartleby after he comes in for an interview. At first, Bartleby is a great worker who writes great work for his boss. However, he has strange and rigid ways of doing his job. When his boss asks him to check a paper for mistakes with him, Bartleby says, I'd rather not. At first, the lawyer thinks he misunderstood what his employee said, but when he says it again and Bartleby still doesn't want to help, a pattern starts to emerge that the lawyer has to deal with. He thinks about firing Bartleby, but then decides to try to talk to him instead. He tells Bartleby that it's common courtesy in this business for everyone to look over copy together for mistakes. Bartleby listens, but he says over and over that he would rather not help. The lawyer thinks about firing Bartleby again, but decides not to because he is busy with other things and thinks Bartleby is useful for what he does do, which is right a lot. And, in fact, the lawyer says that keeping Bartleby around doesn't cost him much or anything, but it makes him feel good and makes him feel less guilty about being a Christian. On his way to church one Sunday morning, the lawyer stops by the office. When he gets there, the office door is locked, and when he opens it, Bartleby is there. Bartleby tells him that he needs a few minutes alone inside, and after the lawyer walks around the block and goes back to the office, he finds himself alone. Now that Bartleby is gone, the lawyer looks in Bartleby's desk, finds a few things, and figures out that Bartleby must be living in the office at night and on weekends. At first, the lawyer feels sorry for Bartleby because he is poor and lives alone. But soon, that sadness turns into anger and disgust because the lawyer thinks Bartleby has a mental illness that can't be cured. He decides to learn more about Bartleby's personal life, find one of Bartleby's relatives to take care of him, and fire Bartleby as soon as possible with a lot of money for severance. The next day, Bartleby is called into the lawyer's office. He asks Bartleby a lot of questions about his family and his past, but Bartleby doesn't want to answer any of them. When he tells Bartleby to calm down, Bartleby says that he would rather not do that too. The next day, Bartleby stops doing any work and just stares at the wall all day. The lawyer decides it's time to get rid of Bartleby from the office. At the end of the week, he gives Bartleby a $20 bonus, which was a lot of money at the time. He also tells him to leave the key behind when he leaves. The lawyer is happy with how he fired Bartleby, but when he comes back to work on Monday, Bartleby is still there, and his $20 bonus is still sitting on his desk, untouched. The next morning, when the lawyer asks Bartleby why he has stayed, Bartleby just says that he would rather not leave. The lawyer knows he has only two choices, he can call the police and have Bartleby taken away, or he can just keep him as an employee. The lawyer decides to keep Bartleby in his office as a worthless worker because he thinks this is the kind thing to do. That is, until other lawyers start talking about how strange it is that Bartleby is in the lawyer's office. When the lawyer thinks that these rumors might hurt his business, he decides to move offices and leave Bartleby for the next tenants or the landlord to deal with. But the landlord soon finds the lawyer and tells him that if the lawyer doesn't help, the police will be called and Bartleby will be taken away by force. The lawyer goes back to his old office and talks to Bartleby. The lawyer makes Bartleby many kind offers, like a new job and a place to stay at his house, but Bartleby turns them all down, so the lawyer leaves in a huff. After a while, the lawyer finds out that Bartleby has been taken to jail. Out of kindness, the lawyer goes to see Bartleby and pays another inmate to feed him well. Bartleby, however, doesn't want to accept this kindness either. He refuses to eat and instead chooses to waste away by lying on the floor of the prison. At this point, the lawyer stops telling Bartleby's story, saying that the reader has to use his or her imagination to figure out how it ends for Bartleby. Instead, the lawyer ends the story by telling what he has heard through rumors, that before Bartleby worked in the Scrivener's office, he burned lost letters for a number of years at the dead letter office. 
About the author. Herman Melville was born in 1819 to a wealthy family in New York City. He went to school there until his father died suddenly in 1832. In 1839, Melville started working as a sailor on a merchant ship. By 1840, he was on a whaling ship, which gave him valuable experience that he used in his first two books, Typee, 1845, and Omu, 1847, two adventure stories that were huge hits with readers. Melville came back to the United States from the sea in 1844. He docked in Boston. Around this time, Melville married Elizabeth Shaw. They had their first child in 1849, which was also the year that his third and fourth books, Marty and Redburn, were published, but neither did very well financially, although Redburn did receive some critical acclaim. Melville moved his family to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in 1850. There, he met and became friends with author Nathaniel Hawthorne, to whom he later dedicated his huge novel Moby Dick, which came out in 1851 to mixed reviews and did not do well financially. His next book, Pierre, came out in 1852. It didn't sell well, and that was the end of Melville's popularity as a writer during his lifetime. Melville then wrote short stories, such as Bartleby, The Scrivener, The Encantadas, and Benito Sereno, which were published in magazines. Melville wrote two more novels and traveled to Europe and then East Asia before coming back to the United States to work as a customs inspector in New York for the rest of his life. Melville wrote poetry near the end of his life. In 1866, he published Battle Pieces and Aspects of War, which was about how he felt about the morality of the Civil War. Melville's oldest son shot himself in the head with a gun and died in 1867. Clarel, a poem and pilgrimage in the Holy Land, which came out in 1876, was Melville's next book. It was about metaphysical and epic ideas. Stanwix, Melville's second son, died in 1886. This made Melville quit his job as a customs inspector. In his last years, before he died of heart disease in 1891, Melville privately published two books of poetry and went back to writing prose, although he never published it. Melville died before he could finish his novella Billy Budd, so it was published after he died in 1924. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.